First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional custodians of this land where we meet. Now, living data, um, I describe living data now as responses of living things, including us, to climate change. And this understanding of, of who we are and what we do has, has taken some time, lots and lots of conversations. Since 2002, actually, since I went to Antarctica as an Antarctic Arts Fellow with the Australian Antarctic Division, and now here with scientists at UTS um, in the Climate Change Cluster, and now at the New School of Life Sciences. So, Living Data is also the name of the program that I lead for combining scientific data and subjective responses. And it builds directly from my PhD, which asks specifically the question, because I'm an animator, how can animation be used to achieve this? And this has since broadened because I'm working with um, more scientists, but also many more artists who have different practices, different um, perceptions and observations to bring to this. So it's not just animation. So how do we do this? How do we combine our different ways of understanding? We have conversations and we make work, we collaborate, we publish together. It's rare, but we have done it. And we do presentations, and because so many of us are artists, and that includes many of the scientists I work with, um, these presentations often take the form of exhibitions. So we have principles. <coughs> the Living Data presentations aim to be true to science, clear in language, and appealing to the senses, and surprising. We want to show you something new or we want to show you things in, in new ways. My particular practice of animation is inspired by dance and the tiny creatures of the sea. In Antarctica, I was introduced to Antarctic krill and the phytoplankton that they feed on. And this installation here is, is what I've been building on over the, the, the years that I've been working with all these collaborators. And we exhibit together. So today I'm going to talk briefly about the early art science connections in history and prehistory, predominantly prehistory and they're ongoing. But mainly I'm going to talk about the global conversations that we are a part of. Global conversations between artists and scientists concerned with climate change. And then I'm going to give you a, a glimpse into future plans, future visions commitments we've already made, up and leading up until right to eight, uh, 2018. So this is very new information and I'm very excited to be sharing this with you. The thing that I realised um, when I was practising this talk today is that I don't have a conclusion because it's a very quick, um, responsive program that we that we run and I have to introduce my colleague Anne Mamadzeki over in the corner there who um, has been working with me since the end of last year, but previously in other projects as well, leading up to this. And things happen so fast, we just have to jump and run with them. And so we'll share those exciting bits of information with you towards the end. So early art science connections, the earliest that we know of, are in, in the indigenous cultures. And this is a typical example of analysis of what's actually going on here within the, the human form, the, the skeletal structure as was understood, and an expression of connection, a gesture of connection to the land. And we know from stories passed down through generations that this particular form is a mini spirit believed in dream time to be here to teach us, amongst other things, to dance and draw. Now this is particularly of interest to me as a, as a dancer and somebody who draws dance and moving living things. It, the Kakadu part notice even describes this, this act of drawing as being more important than the painting itself. So many older paintings are covered by younger ones, typically in, in Indigenous Australian art. And one reason for this could well be that the knowledge that's passed on through the drawing comes through the body, it's body knowledge. So the act of drawing is then in the person who's been initiated into this and they can more easily and more authentically pass this knowledge on through their own practice. Now, 
there's an ancient form of Chinese calligraphy that's very much grounded in dance or movement. I don't know if they would have called it dance, but in ancient times, there were um, dots and lines inscribed on the grave into bones and, and turtle shells. And these have then been transformed through a brush, a, a practice with a, a brush and large pieces of paper into a, an art form, a calligraphic art form. And this is practiced by one of our Living Data colleagues here in Sydney, Vicky Quill. Now, Fiona McGowan, who's a, a, a scholar of Indigenous Australian art, says this, which can be equally applied to, to the ancient in, uh, Chinese art. Indigenous cultures have long established languages of gestures and line drawings with performance flows that correlate with the vitality of the shapes, sounds and movements of the landscape. So you can see there a very deep body connection with how the world works and how things connect. So this is Vicky performing her calligraphic practice to some colleagues. This is part of my PhD. We, had, we ran workshops and in conversation with scientists and other artists, we came up with ways to, sh to share our, our knowledge of of what's happening in the ocean particularly. So Vicky um, charges the brush with black ink, imagines, conceives of the ink as the blood and the body, and the fibres in the brush as extensions of the fibres in the muscles, and quickly makes these forms. And typically these practitioners work in groups, and when they're preparing for a show, it, things happen very quickly. They produce the work and then together they assess which ones are more vital, more alive. And then they have the show. So it's a vibrant living form of art. Now this is a still from a, a motion capture video that we did here at UTM <coughs> of Vicky performing the ancient calligraphic form for ocean. And you'll see that in some of the videos I'm going to show you soon. Now, in 2007, I attended a conference on early childhood art, and I met Dr. John Sidney Matthews, who had studied the drawings and dances and behaviours of great apes in the Singapore Zoo, <clears throat> and of young children in a nearby primary school. And he was interested in how these primal gestural forms, what, what, what do they mean? And, um, and are they still alive and well in the, in the art of the young humans? And he observed this particular gesture, and this is a tracing that I made of a video of a great ape drawing with his knuckles in the sand. And as you might suspect, um, this does in fact mean, this marks my spot, this is a territorial gesture. So these primal forms then started to really fascinate me as ways of connecting the, um, what we know about processes happening in the, in, the, in the actual world and expressions of connection to that world. Now in my dance training I had studied the work of Rudolf Laban who was an analyst of dance. He wasn't so much an artist or choreographer. He devised a set of dance movements specifically to clarify your understanding of how you move and how others you, you observe are moving. And he broke it down into use of space, time and energy. And through this practice, it makes it possible to be clear enough to recognize the patterns in your own movement and work with those to develop choreographies that are specifically yours. And in observing other people, this practice has also been um, used to observe such things as congruence. For example, is what you're, you're saying congruent with how you're describing that thing through your gestures? So in a funny sort of way, there, there have been some American uh, studies done in this of speeches of politicians analysing their gestures as they speak. So it's kind of, you might call it like a lie detector. Mm -hmm. Now here's one of those practitioners, uh, her name's Peggy Hackney, and I've done workshops with her during my research. 
and she's taken this to analyse the differences in gestures used by two politicians. And this, this one here, by Obama's performance, is called Waving the Ball. And I uh, listened to this again last night on um, YouTube, and, he's, and her analysis of this movement is that he's saying something and he wants you to go along with him on this. So it may be an instinctive gesture that he's doing, but it's certainly worth remembering and keeping in mind when, we, when we're talking and sharing information that's really important for us to know for our survival, such as climate change messages, that, that we use, the, use our body wisely and um, with clarity. Now another, um, I suppose, validation of this value of the gesture is uh, in, the, in the work of Leonardo, another fine example about science coming together. And Rita, Rita McCarthy from the Institute of Art in Chicago writes that da Vinci believed that the moral and ethical meanings of his narrative paintings would emerge only through the accurate representation of human gesture and expression. So Leonardo was telling stories through images and he recognised the value of the, of the human gesture as, as a vital component in accurate communication. Now I'm just briefly mentioning some of the relationships or influences of, of, of science on, on artists um, leading up to our time. And there's a whole lot of work about colour that you might like to go and visit in the UTS gallery at the moment. Um, so I'm, I, I could go on about that for a long time, so I didn't do that. This is just an example of Picasso's um, picking up on the vibes, what was known and promoted from the science at the time. This is actually psychology, which you might not recognise as a, a hard science, but there was a lot of talk about um, dreams and depths of, of human expression that are not, um, I suppose, so evident in day-to-day -day society, particularly not the society at that time.